So Superman but Batman Public Enemies is, is really a uh, villain-driven story. What was interesting about um, Justice League as opposed to the other shows was up until then, I'd really had the luxury of each episode being The weird thing about this movie, because it's really more about the fact that even though they clash, they're really best buddies. Now we're yep. talking 1991. 1991. I listened to mm, 250, God. 300 different voice actors. It turns out you were actually the first person to speak in an episode of Batman, but you weren't playing Batman. You were playing a blimp pilot over Gotham City. Oh. like that. <laughs> <laughs> the man bat flies by you. Did you see that? Did you there see was that? a ghost. It just flipped across my screen. Oh, it's great to have you guys yeah, all here. Of course. All right, then. Hey, guys. Oh, thank you. God, we saw so many actors. I can't remember. We, saw, we it must have been fifty actors, and every, some some of them were like people that we never heard of before. Some of them were like former TV and movie heroes that their agents thought, oh yeah, maybe this guy would be good for you. And nobody was anywhere close. Well, to what we wanted. the truth is, when we first did the, no, what are we talking? Nineteen ninety one. Nineteen ninety one. Nineteen ninety yeah, 90 was probably started the casting, and as I sent out all the paperwork and all the scripts and stuff to the agents throughout town, uh, and they sent me back auditions from the initial run. Mm -hmm. I, I listened to oh, 250, God. 300 different voice actors mm -hmm. for the role, and then pared that down to 50 that we would bring into audition mm -hmm. to see how their acting ability was, how their, uh, if they understood what voiceover acting was as compared to on-camera acting, yeah. how uh, well they took direction, how pleasant they were to be in the room with. Mm -hmm. And we uh, truly went down to, you know, got down to about five or six, but as I recall... We didn't have anybody that we liked. No, we exactly. Had, we had nobody that we exactly. was even in the running. Exactly. And we'd, we'd already done like three days That's of, right. of Batman. Just Batman audition. Just Batman. At the time, were you guys ordered to series or just pilot? Oh, no, it was a series. series. And you had you already had your artwork and you had oh, yeah. your designs yeah. no, it was, and everything. That's the way things were back then. And you, had, yeah. uh, you, got, you got the go-ahead pretty easily. And right. who wrote the pilot? Was it? Uh, was it? A friend of mine named Mitch Bryan. Yeah. But I remember as we were doing the audition, we were like, you know, this guy could work, and this guy could work, but it's really, it's, it's not there. We weren't loving anybody. And so I remember calling all my friends that I knew that were in casting for On Camera. And, say, um, how did you find Kevin? Uh, yeah. uh, Anthony Barneo, I believe, was uh, my well, dear right. friend Anthony, who I went to college with at wow. Fredonia, New York, in, you know, 1974. Mm -hmm. And he said, you know, there's an actor that's got a terrific voice, who's just a great actor, you should at least give him a try. Kevin Conroy is his name. <clears throat> and I remember this day so very Your well. Your agent must have been great that they just didn't get you in that. You know what? Way. He wasn't with a voiceover well, I'd agent. I'd never done oh. uh, animation at all. Right. Oh. He, he didn't have a voiceover agent. It was a theatrical. So I tracked you down right. and said, w will he come in and read? And I remember the day so vividly. We were at a studio in the middle of Glendale, Soundcastle yeah. Studios, and uh, we're all exhausted. It's days and days, and we're thinking, we're never going to find this, and it's so important. It's Batman. It's yeah. got to be a great voice and a great mm -hmm. actor. And uh, and Kevin walked through the door, and very nice to meet you, and he's very pleasant. And, and first of all, all of all the women in the room went, yeah, <laughs> yeah <that's right. laughs> before he even opened that's his mouth. Right. We, we like right. this guy. That's right. Oh, I didn't so, hear that part. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. And then uh, Kevin got behind the microphone and asked a few questions, really simple questions, uh, questions the likes of, uh, how different do you want Bruce Wayne to be from Batman? Mm -hmm. Because you certainly could play them completely differently, yeah. or you could play them so similarly. Mm -hmm. And so we sat down and. Um, and Kevin opened his mouth and started reading the script. And I remember Bruce and I looking at each other, and our faces just lit up, and we're like, oh. Yeah, it was electric. We have found it. It's there. Mm -hmm. He understands it. His voice is there. We played, you know, several different versions, and I remember playing with you and saying, just for the heck of it, try this. Mm -hmm. And why don't we see what happens if you do this? And what if this happens? And how about if the scene starts with you're already in action, or, you know, that kind of thing. And and having not, and knowing that you had not done this before, it was really just a matter of sort of running you through your paces and thinking, can he mm -hmm. get the energy? Can he understand without being able to use the physical face, you know, Whatever kind of yeah, physical because action. I'd never done anything like right. that before. You didn't want to cast someone who wouldn't be able to right. run the race. Exactly, you know, really and we were still babies in the industry. Oh, yeah. We really Absolutely. had a, a couple of years' experience. We worked on Animaniacs together mm -hmm. for a couple of years, but that was a completely different ball game. Yeah. You know, just as silly and goofy a cartoon as you can imagine. And my only exposure to Batman had been the Adam West series. Right, right. I Which wasn't is... really familiar with the Dark Knight. Uh, you know the. Uh, Right. The, the cartoon, right. The way you guys right. Explain all that to me. Absolutely. Right. And we went for a very dark, 
version. This was yeah. not at all. Yeah. This was very, and, and I think what made it work so well too was that it was very realistic acting. Yeah. Right. And and even as the show evolved, it, as you look at the first episodes even now, they were they were cartoony. Yeah, they were. And we well, were do you just remember we went back and re-recorded some of the stuff Absolutely. from the first couple of episodes Absolutely. after the voices were more established. Absolutely. Yeah. Because originally I was doing a very different sound between Bruce and. And right. Batman. Absolutely. And you you toned that down after right. a while. Right. Mm -hmm. So when we were doing ADR, when the animation came back, we went, you know what? That voice has evolved, yeah. and we have to go back and make it not so broad. Yeah. But even still, yet those first episodes are much broader than I the was later say, ones. Even today, when I go back and watch them, <laughs> it's, I mean, it's like no offense to your performance, but you're so much better now. Because you, I think you just you've gotten so used How to the could part. How I be better? Then? You're, <laughs> well, you're, you're fine. Okay. Fine. fine. Yes. Um, in joke. Mm -hmm. And uh, um, but yeah, when I watch those early ones, it's like yeah, it doesn't sound. It, it's just like you've just gotten better as an actor and as as a as, as a person. Like I said, you're you're you're. And you get you're more comfortable. Confident. Exactly. You get more sure. confident. Exactly. Sure. Yeah. Well, I think what yeah. you said though I mean, about it being realistic is so key because I think prior to that. You know, most people's experience with Batman were either Adam West in the TV series, you know, or uh, uh, you so know, late, Friends oh, 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 right. mm -hmm. in, the, in the cartoon series. Yeah, but any any animation though before that, I was going to say, in cartoon, all yeah. animation yeah. was just cartoony. Right. It was yes. very cartoony, and that and that very sort of, you know, uh, uh, you know, uh, voice of authority kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden, you know, you came to it, and the way that you guys approached the character, all of a sudden had layers and it was rounded. And was like three dimensions. Well, you know, it's funny because even though, like you said, when you go back and watch those early ones now, they do sound a little bit cartoonier than what we do now. But at the time, I remember when we first delivered the first vocal tracks to the network, they said, it sounds flat. Because they're so used to having, even on adventure though. cartoons, right. they're, they're expecting everybody to be you know, doing wacky voices and really, right. really high right. energy. And we were going for a naturalistic kind of sound design. And so, yeah, they said, they said, everybody sounds flat. We think you have to redo everything. And it's like, we're not redoing anything. <laughs> I'm sorry, this is, what we, this is what it's supposed to sound like. Right. So, right. I mean, so yeah, it was, it, it seems crazy now, but at the time it was like radical. Yeah, it, it was. was radical. And I remember the first ADR session, because I was in there with Mark Hamill. Right. We went at the same time, and no one had seen, none of the actors had seen, mm. right. what it was going to actually look like or right. sound like. Right. Mm -hmm. And right. we're sitting in the same booth together, and we're, the, the, the footage comes over the big screen, and the score comes up. And I looked at Mark and said, did you have any idea this is what we were working on? Because the visuals were so beautiful. So different. The artwork was so beautiful. So dark. I mean, not talking, not just about the style that we did the voice work in, but the, the, the backgrounds were dark. The dark. You, guys, you guys painted on black. It was painted on black. Right. Black yeah. paper, yeah, right. we started with black That was a whole different was so technique. Beautiful. Wasn't yeah. that never mm -hmm. really been done before? Yeah. Yeah. It How do you, you just couldn't find the white paper? <laughs> you were out of white paper. <laughs> the black was cheaper. That so was uh, my co-producer, Eric Radomsky. That was his innovation. He was just experimenting one day, and he literally had some black cardboard. And he said, well, what if I start with black? And he just went over it with like some Prismacolor pencils. And I went, oh, that looks really kind of cool. It's like, yeah, we want the show to be dark anyways. So if we start with dark and add light, then you don't have to worry about it being too bright. And in fact, we actually had problems technically when we did the uh, the telecine on the first couple shows, literally the telecine operators looked at us and said, um, I hate to tell you this, but your show is legally too dark for broadcast air. Legal. Wow. Legally too dark. They're, they literally have like these these bandwidth, you know, ratios or whatever. It's like the colors have to be within a certain safe place. And, and it's like, how can it be too dark? Wow. You know, it's like, how can it be legally too dark? But yeah. Yeah. Am I going to be arrested? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Arrest the artist. <laughs> You know, it's funny, I was thinking about this when we were talking about getting together for dinner and our years of experience together, and all the various different incarnations that the Batman animated projects have been in. Yeah. And as we, after we did Batman the Animated Series, and it, and it sort of evolved when it became Batman and Robin, which mm -hmm. was a little bit different, mm -hmm. and then um, when Batman we did Batman Beyond. Beyond, and we were thinking, okay, now we're going to have this story where we have Bruce Wayne, who's a much, much older man, and uh, what are we going to do about that voice? And we went, well, we just have Kevin do it, <laughs> and we just have him do it. I mean, we did toy with the idea of getting, like, you know, if we could have gotten, like, stunt casting, like Gregory Peck or something. Right, we, we did chat about that. that. But then yeah, uh, no, at absolutely. the end of the day, it was like, come on, Kevin can do it. Absolutely, no, and, and, that, and that continuity, I thought, was absolutely. a brilliant idea. Yeah. Because it, it, it kept, I think, a lot of the fans responded to that really positively, sure. uh -huh. verbally to me often. Mm -hmm. They were like, yeah. that was such a great idea. And I mean, was that fun for you, getting to, be, oh, getting to play yeah. a completely different kind of oh, Batman? Yeah, because it was doing the character whole arc of the character. Mm -hmm. Over so many yep. years, and had it had that ever been unusual. done before? I don't I think so. No, I don't know that we ever met not. Bruce Wayne at what was he 75, 80 years yeah, old. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
That was great. That well, was I great. remember even. But a very youthful lady. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he was I was so going to say, it's the future. Everybody's a little bit younger in the future, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah. But even recently, when we did the Batman Gotham Knights project, and there were you know different versions of Bruce or Batman mm -hmm. in the in you know in the different pieces, and some looked younger and some looked older. You know, you managed to still be that character with like mm -hmm. very subtle shifts, so it never felt out of place that this right. character seemed really young or that scene one seemed a lot older. And we're asking you at the time, like, was that difficult? You basically said, no, it's fine, it's good. <laughs> well, I, I think actors love challenges. Mm -hmm. They do. They love to stretch yep. mm -hmm. and do do new things. Yeah, it was so interesting too to watch you when you would do the voice of Batman because we all know you as really a fun-loving guy, but there's this sort of dark seriousness that would come over as you do the voice and when we would do the voice of the older Bruce Wayne it became it, your physicality became so much more contained and quiet mm -hmm. and there was this kind of bitterness about the character because he really could no longer physically be Batman mm -hmm. and that's kind of how we began the right. series as I recall was mm -hmm. that concept that yeah. he could no he longer maintain it. it right yeah. and he had to get someone else to be the young Batman mm -hmm. the Terry McGinnis that the character became yeah. played by Will Friedle. And, um, and it was just so fun to watch you because even the way you would work the microphone technically, you would get so much closer to it and the voice became so much deeper and the way you would produce that older sound. It's fascinating to That's watch. That's interesting to hear because I always had that reaction watching Mark Hamill. Because Mark, what? Oh, when he's the visually, Joker? Physically, when yeah. he does the Joker, mm -hmm. he really... Mm. Nope, he I goes to another place. He's amazing to watch. He really is. Carrot cakes. Really. So it's, uh, I, Thank I find you. that interesting that you say that. Uh, yeah. that I do that too. Yeah. Well, that's. I, I love watching actors how they manage the physicality. Yeah. And you know, in, in voiceover acting, I, I've been working in it in, for 25 some odd years, and um, some actors are just fine just sitting, and then, and some actors absolutely have to stand. Yeah. Mark Hamill cannot act sitting down. <laughs> yeah, he just can't stand. do it. He has to stand yeah. because he just has this whole thing. Now, as you did Batman at the beginning, as I remember, you did used to stand. Did and then as you got more and more used to it, and certainly when we started doing the older version yeah. of it, it was easy to, easier to do sitting down because it, you know, you have a, a lesser uh, uh, use of the diaphragm and I everything. I just felt very rooted doing that. In sitting? Sitting. Really? Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. But it's so fun to watch actors, and I always encourage people to do the physicality of what's going on, which is, mm -hmm. you know, part of my job is I describe what is happening physically in the scene. And so, then you watch the actor do it. And the, the, the fun thing always is when someone is wearing a noisy shirt oh, yeah. or noisy jewelry. And, and you're like, oh, I'm sorry, you know, you're, you're, you, you can't, you know, you, you gotta be your shirt. Your shirt is making noise. And all right, the shirt's gotta go. <laughs> and so the actor takes off the shirt and hangs it up and works in their t shirt. And so that's always been kind of a fun thing for yeah. me, a little job perk. <laughs> Now did, at the time, were, did you and Mark record together a lot, or you would just sort of see each other's session? We would do ensemble record. A lot of always ensemble. Always ensemble. Really? I love ensemble could. record. And that, was that also made the show very unique. I agree. Because it always was ensemble. Yeah. So many, it acted like many, a radio play. Absolutely. Many, many studios record each actor separately. But well, because I think technically they have more control that way, don't they? Over um, the sound? I think that they don't always have the ability to focus on all the different things that are going on when there's eight actors in the room, ten yeah, actors in the room. True, right. But I think that a great part, and you can certainly well, correct oh, me, but I no, think absolutely. reacting is oh, a absolutely. major part of it. No, you're so right to do it that uh, way. And the so, quality of the performances doesn't compare. But it's what the other studios did it that way to have more control over I think the so. sound. Yeah. But then you get a more voice. stilted performance. But absolutely, it's I think. more sterile. And it's it more time consuming because what I have to do then as a director, if I'm directing you all by yourself, is I have to get 20 different takes from you because I'm not sure exactly what the actor before you or after right. you is going to do. Right. I got to make sure it's going to flow and sound like you are, right. in fact, in the room at the same time. No, I love doing it as a play with everyone together. And I know all the other actors have loved that too. They do. Everybody absolutely. reacts well to that. And we would bring in guests, people again who had not done this before, and, and then to bring them into a room where everybody else has done it can somewhat be intimidating at the same time I think it it lets them watch how it's done mm -hmm. and they learn and they go oh okay that's what you need to do so you bring someone who hasn't done it right. and they go oh okay I see what Kevin's doing yeah. mm -hmm. now now I know that I have the freedom to change the line a little bit or uh, you know be a little bit you know and now I know that physically if Andrea says I'm running then I can go ahead and do that mm -hmm. and so I think that always was uh, I gotta say I always loved how much freedom you guys gave me to have fun in the recording well, yeah, you don't mess because with it, kept, <laughs> no, but it kept the it kept the atmosphere up yeah. in the recording studio because mm -hmm. it could get really yeah, it's kind of a heavy, it could show, get yeah. heavy and boring absolutely and, you know you know absolutely